Welcome to Advanced Patient Care, a podcast series by Vance Thompson Vision. Today's podcast is featuring advances in refractive cataract surgery, and I'm your host, Russell Swan. Uh, this podcast is here to bring you the latest advancements, cutting edge research, and practical tips that you can apply to your clinic practice right away. So if you're ready to expand your knowledge, stay ahead of the curve, and elevate your practice, you're in the right spot. And fortunately, I've got three great people to help us achieve that goal today. So without further ado, again, my name is Russell Swan. I'm a cataract and refractive surgeon as well as cornea and glaucoma specialist with Vance Thompson Vision out in Bozeman, Montana. And we're going to start off with Keith. Keith, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and share one fun fact if you would like to, bud? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Russell. So I'm Keith Rasmussen. And uh I'm an optometrist here at Vance Thompson Vision here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, I'm a South Dakota native. I grew up in a small town about an hour northwest of Sioux Falls. Uh, Went to Pacific University and did a residency in Reno, Nevada and Las Vegas, Nevada, and have been here with Vance Thompson Vision here in Sioux Falls for 20 years. This summer will be 20 years. Um, Have a wife and four kids, so they keep me busy. Um, But yeah, it's been quite a ride. 20 years, Keith. That's awesome. I love it. Wow. <laughs> uh, Brandon, you get you get to follow that up, bud. Boy, uh, hard to do, but I've been feel like I've been living in Keith's shadow since I started here. I'm Brandon Bart. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm uh, an anterior segment surgeon. I, I did my fellowship up in um, in Sioux Falls with uh, with Keith and uh, and the group up there, uh, which was almost seven years ago now, which is wild. Um but uh, I, I'm in Omaha now, and I, I specialize in cataract refractive cornea and glaucoma as well. Uh, I'm the father of uh, three wonderful children, including a newborn Molly. And I I know it's it's a lot, um, but I'm I'm thrilled. And I I love cataract surgery. Honestly, I'm just going to put that out there right now. This is my favorite thing. <laughs> and uh, and I can't wait to uh, spend the next three hours talking about it with you guys. Because that's that's our time on our right. three hours, something like that. And if Brandon just like snoozes off and falls asleep, it's probably because Molly woke him up last night. So, uh, and in the excitement of uh, new kiddos in the crew, Tanner, take it take it away, bud. That's right. I'm Tanner Ferguson. I'm a uh, cataract refractive cornea and glaucoma surgeon at our Sioux Falls and also our Sioux City location. I'm originally from the Sioux City area, so it's been fun uh, being back in that area, taking care of. Uh, those people that I, um, you know, played a role in helping me who I am today. Um, I followed the similar pathway training wise as Russell and Brandon and was a medical student hanging around here at our Sioux Falls site when they were fellows. So looked up to them and was lucky to follow in their footsteps. Um, I just joined uh, the practice last July after my uh, fellowship last year. And as Russell mentioned, Kayla and I, Kayla is one of our optometrists here as well. And had the good fortune of being our first resident and trained alongside Brandon for a year. Um, good fortune for Brandon. Had, yeah, it was great. good. Good fortune for me. Well, I was trying to spin this in the positive yeah. light. Okay. <laughs> um, fun fact: I have more hair than Keith, but less flow than Brandon. Uh, so <laughs> in the cataract surgery. Sweet. <laughs> so we- well, our our kind of uh, flow, so to speak, for today is we're going to kind of talk through the preoperative exam. Um, that's going to be our first part. And then session two of this discussion is going to be talking about all the great lenses that are now out there in the refractive cataract surgery space and how to have a conversation with your patients about that. And then I'm super excited. Part three is going to be sort of what would you do? What would we do with it with our own eyes? What would we do with some case examples? And then we'll walk through the post-op. So let's jump into the pre-op part. And Keith, I'm going to throw this to you first. You know, we have thousands and thousands of patients that come into our clinics every uh, every year to see us for a cataract evaluation and have a conversation. Can you kind of walk through what that experience is like from a standpoint of when they walk in the door and what things were testing, uh, what things you're looking at, and what things you're talking to them about. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Russell. So, you know, we're we're blessed in all of our locations to have a lot of amazing referring optometrists that send patients in to see us. So we're blessed to work side by side with a lot of optometrists. Um, We mainly just do surgery, um, secondary and tertiary care type of thing. So we don't do any primary care. So um, a lot of times those patients come in and see us and they're 
already well on their way of being educated from their primary optometrist. Um, we have a, an excellent staff here as well that will send patients out um, videos and pamphlets and give them phone calls. And so a lot of what we do is about education. Um, and I think we'll probably touch on this in a little bit, but you know, a lot of times patients will come in and um, kind of have an idea as far as what cataracts are all about and what types of implants they want to do. Um, but when they come in, we're just kind of honing in on what's going to be the best for their eyes and how they want to see after surgery. Perfect. Uh, Brandon, I'm going to have you get into some of the nitty gritty for us, if you don't mind. So I'd love to kind of talk through, you know, what the common diagnostic tests that a patient's going to go through as part of the preoperative exam and maybe kind of highlighting why some of those tests are important, um, even though many of those we may not charge for, but we want that information. So maybe walk us through some of that. Yeah. I, and, and that's a, it's a, it's a hot topic and it's an evolving topic, right? Because I feel like even since uh, I started the practice down here, you know, almost six years ago, uh, it's changed, right? Because the technology changes and, and it gets better and we use different information in different ways. And so, um, you know, we have kind of a, a large number of, of tests and scans that we'll, we'll put patients through in the most, you know, efficient way possible, but the, we've got a lot of data we need. So, of course, for any cataract surgery, you know, we're paying attention to their ocular history. We're taking a good ocular history. We're taking, like Keith said, we're taking into account their personality and, and what, they, what they're looking for. But from an objective standpoint, we need to know what's their habitual refraction, right? What are they used to in terms of contact lenses or glasses, um, we like to get an auto refraction on them. Of course, we want to have a biometry so we can uh, get a measurement of the front surface of the eye uh, and the length of the eye so we can come up with an accurate lens power. Um, but we also start using things like uh, topography, right? We use it topo topography all the time, not just in measuring the, the corneal power, but in noting the regularity of the corneal surface and the tear film. And how sharp are the Myers on the disc reflecting off the cornea? Um, uh, the other uh, technologies we're commonly getting are um, OCTs. OCT is becoming more and more important in an ophthalmology, not just anymore for getting a scan of the macula, which we do on every patient, but the optic nerve, right? And understanding the health of that, that optic nerve, uh, as well as more recently for me, the thickness of the epithelium. Right, so we we're learning more about epith epithelial thickness profiles. Maybe we get into that in a little more depth because I think it's worth it. But um, understanding the pattern of thickness on the surface of the eye and how it may have changed in relation to dryness or keratoconus or post refractive surgery, all of these things can play into you know the kinds of things that we're thinking about uh, when we're trying to select the right lens for a patient. Awesome. Uh, Tanner, I'm going to have you expand on one of the things Brandon talked about, because when, you know, back in the day when Brandon, Keith and I were in training, there was, you know, higher order aberrations were kind of a, a made up word that maybe two or three people knew about, <laughs> but not very many people did. And now it's kind of in the common vernacular of what we talk about every day when we're evaluating a cornea. So can you maybe talk about, you know, one, what are higher order aberrations? Two, how do we evaluate those and, and why do they matter when it comes to our conversation around cataract surgery? Sure. So higher order aberrations are essentially small irregularities present in your cornea. Um, we measure them and there's a few like common types that people will talk about. The most three most important are spherical aberration, um, coma, and then trefoil. But the ones we most commonly hear about or have or easy to relate to visual significance are coma and spherical aberration. And in all of our sites, we all, I think we almost all have a NIDEC um, or an OPD or a Penicam, and both of which can measure the magnitude of corneal uh, hyoid aberrations. I mean, I think getting a quantitative measurement um, and then using, I think everybody probably has a different um, comfort level with, um, in terms of like a certain level. I think on the NIDEC, most people get concerned when that level is above for the total um, high order aberration when that total is above 0.5 for the cornea. They start to get a little bit nervous about um, a more advanced or diffractive IOL. And, you know, I think over time we've learned how to use that information to guide the IOL decision-making 
um, discussion and process. And we've also learned that the IOL technology has improved to where, um, you know, I think we used to be more conservative with those numbers, but with the advancements in the IOL technology, I think we're willing to push a little bit more. Um, but I think, you know, like you guys said, I've been really lucky. I've used that since day one in practice. And I think it's a helpful tool to making sure uh, the patient's going to be happy with the eyewall that we put in their eye. Okay, so some quick uh, quick survey. Brandon and Keith, is it trefoil or trefoil? Brandon, what is it? Trefoil. Trefoil. Keith? I say trefoil as well. Oh, see, that's what I meant. Oh, so I don't know. But Tanner's going team. trefoil. And yeah, you haven't heard about trefoil? Yes, it's very green. It's it's very it's way more important than trefoil. I don't actually, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to feel bad if Tanner is right. I mean, I feel like he probably is right, but uh, trefoil sure sounds cool, I think. That's so. right. Uh, and then this, the second thing I would, I, I'd love for you guys, we, when you think about, you know, the particularly the scans that we're getting. So if I had to tell you preoperatively for your cataract evaluation, you have a, a IOL or optical biometer. You have a regular topography. You have a way to evaluate higher order aberrations and you have an OCT. Top to bottom, most important to least important, uh, how are you rating those four things for great cataract surgery outcomes? Keith, you got to take it first. Oh boy. Well, I'd say the biometry is most important just because we need to figure out what power of implant is going to go Trick in the Trick question. Eye. Trick um, question. <laughs> But, but the, the cool thing about this is the, the instruments that you just listed off um, have a lot to do with refractive surgery. And so, you know, this cataract surgery nowadays isn't just everybody gets a monofocal implant. So that's the cool and exciting stuff. But what we're talking about today is um, it's really refractive surgery and how we talk to our patients, how they want to see after surgery with glasses, without glasses, um, all these other um pieces of equipment, topographies, um, OCTs, um, NIDACs to get high order aberrations, they're all um, coming back to the refractive status of the eye and how we're going to maximize that. So um, I think kind of basic overall arching to answer your question, I'd say biometry first is so we can get an implant in the eye. And then um, I would want to see topographies, um, high well, high order aberrations, which probably goes along with topographies and then OCTs. Any, gonna, any, anyone say differently? No, I'm exactly the same for the exact yeah. same. I mean, I, I was just going to say I was going to pull a Vance and say all of them. You know, if you, <laughs> you, you can't rank me, force rank them. We'll just we'll, we'll take them all, which is kind of our approach. Uh, but there are a lot. I bring it up because, you know, there are a lot of practices out there to your point, Keith, uh, that don't think of cataract surgery as a refractive surgery. And they may say, hey. Just an IOL bi biometer is just mm -hmm. all we need. And we don't need to have a topography. And we can put a toric lens in without a topography. And oh, wait, that patient had irregular astigmatism. And maybe that wasn't a, a great option. So I do think all of those really play an important role in kind of what we do today. Um, Brandon, I'm curious. Can you jump through for me um, when you think, you know, Keith talked a little bit about when we have patients coming in, a lot of times they've already been seen by a primary eye care provider. What's kind of the the most important information or most helpful information uh, that you're seeing on a note coming in for you for a patient that has a cataract and is being referred to you for surgery? What are the most helpful things that a primary eye care doctor can do to help prepare that patient and also to help prepare you for the conversation? Yeah, I, I think this is a really, really important uh, question and, and something worth spending some time on. Every a referral, I I hope anyway, and in most cases, like we've got a great network of docs that send in, and most all referrals have these, um, you know, forms that that are addressed to us with the patient's history and things like what is their best corrected vision, right, uh, and what's their visual potential, right. We have the question on there: when did when were they at their visual potential? How long ago, and what was it? Um, and then their ocular history, like this patient uh, has been a habitual uh, multifocal contact lens wearer for a long time, or a patient loves monovision, or, you know, all of these little uh, important details about their past um, experience with these patients. I, I can't, I can't overstate how important those things are to me, because I use that information, not only to help 
like guide appropriate care and make sure we're not missing something like a history of LASIK or something else, right? But also uh, equally important, it helps establish um, that relationship um, connection between us, the patient and the referring doctor. It's like when the patient leaves their office scared, knowing, oh my gosh, you, I came in for new glasses and now you're telling me I need to have surgery to see better. Um, if they know that we're in communication, like, oh, hey, I got to review this note from Dr. So-and-so. They were mentioning to me about this, that, or the other thing. All of a sudden, the loop feels more closed and secure to a patient who's already feeling vulnerable. So equally important to the information I'm getting is what that communication means to that patient. Perfect. I love it. I, I think that's a great kind of wrap up commentary on the preoperative section. And again, I think it's this beautiful meld of the information you get on the front end from someone who's had a long-term relationship with a patient and then taking that information and blending it with the, you know, great technology that we have to evaluate their eye to know kind of what options are best for them that really create a beautiful spot. So um, what I'd like Russell, to do, yeah. Russell, do you mind if I mention one more thing? Uh, um, I would I love, love it. All the, the technical stuff that we get, visual acuities, biometries, that sort of stuff. But one of the more meaningful things for me too is what's the patient do for an occupation? What are some of their hobbies? Because um, we're going to learn a lot about those things in terms of how they use their eyes and how they want to see after surgery. And so that for me is huge um, in helping a patient choose a uh, which type of IOL would be best suit their lifestyles. Yeah. Keith, I think that's such a great point. I think about you know, my parents who are, have not had cataract surgery, they're beating the average, but they're getting to the seventies. And my mom loves to be in her sewing room as much as possible and mm. loves that super, super fine up close vision. And my dad could drive 12 hours in a day and just think it was the greatest day in the history of days. Mm. And, and their visual desires might have be a little bit different, um, either occupationally <laughs> or hobby wise. So I think that's a, that's a great, great point. So uh, Tanner, any other closing thoughts you have on the pre-op part before we jump into the next section? The only other historical um, point that I think is important to include is, does the patient have prism in their glasses? Because no matter what lens we put in their eye, what cataract surgery we do, they're going to need that prism after surgery. And I yeah. think it's always an important thing to pick up um, when you're evaluating a patient or sending them. So, Yeah, great, great point. Absolutely perfect. Um and, and last, and I would just highlight again, the comorbidities that a lot of people talked about, you know, we, the last podcast series talked a lot about how do we deal with glaucoma as a comorbidity, both in terms of MIG surgeries, but also in terms of IOL implants, obviously macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, a lot of those things do play a big role. 